Well, uh, thanks for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to come speak to the people that we try to serve and uh, participate in your care. I thank you for that. So, um, and I'd like to thank Dr. Silver and Dr. Spivak for inviting me. So I'd like to talk to you about a point that John uh, entered into, which is epigenetic therapy for myeloproliferative neoplasms that we've been exploring. And this is very preliminary data, so this is not ready for prime time, but I just want you to be aware of it. So um, this is what we, uh, how we conceptualize, I feel very psychotic here going back and forth, I don't know how to do that, but <laughs> as you guys all realize, what we're talking about here is uh, these uh, disturbing diseases that unfortunately many of you suffer from, and that's essential thrombocythemia, primary myelofibrosis, and polycythemia vera. And you all are all too familiar with the complications of this disease and then the unusual process of these diseases going on to progress to myelofibrosis and eventually to an extremely untreatable form of acute myeloid leukemia. In the early phases of these diseases, early PMF, PV, and ET, the uh, clinical course of your diseases are punctuated by thrombosis and hemorrhage and systemic symptoms. And then um, the hope is, is that um, well, the fear is that the disease will then progress. Now, um, the goals of treatment are very different. So our goals of treatment here are basically all geared toward preventing thrombosis and hemorrhage. Because that was sort of like low-lying low -lying fruit, at least was thought. And there's some questions whether our therapy is really very effective. We're not very good at preventing progression of this disease, and that's the key factor, especially as patients are being diagnosed at an earlier age. So John referred to this as epigenetics. So uh, I took this little quote from Nature, which is obviously a high-profile journal for scientists, and they define epigenetics as the study of heritable changes in gene expression that are not due to changes in DNA sequence. So the sequence is sort of like the code. And these epigenetic modifications essentially allow you to alter expression of a particular gene. And this is very, very important for diverse biological properties that can be affected for ep epigenetic mechanisms, like why, uh, why is the morphology of a flower different, although all the cells are the same? Why do your eyes, why are my eyes green and my skin is white? These are all epigenetic changes in cells that have originated from, from a variety of uh, primitive cells when we were born and is the basis really of development um, in, our, in the way we appear. So epigenetic changes are crucial for development and differentiation of various cell types and they also alter cellular processes, such as, for instance, whether we're a man or a woman. Um, and epigenetic changes can be dis become disrupted by environmental influences or during aging. That's probably why we get change as we appear, our appearance changes as we get old. And the importance of epigenetic changes in the development of cancer or other diseases is really a major focus of research right now in a variety of different malignancies. So again, epigenetics is the study of gene expression or cellular phenotype caused by mechanisms other than changes in DNA sequence. These are not mutations. These are modifications to the genome that involve a change in, 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 in the activation of a particular gene. And the major processes, as John referred to, is essentially the status of the promoter regions of these particular genes. Those are sort of like the regions that turn the gene on. Their methylation status, and also the acetylation status of histones, which is the core that the DNA um, wraps itself around. So this is another schematic that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but we have drugs now that can alter these turning off of genes. And one of them is a group of drugs that are called DNA methyltransferase inhibitors. 
We have several of those in that are FDA approved, azacitidine and decitabine, and I'll talk about the use of this drug in this group of patients. And then another broad class of drugs that are called histone deacetylase inhibitors. If our genes are, uh, if our chrominin is acetylated, then the genes are active. If it's deacetylated, then the chrominin condenses and you can no longer produce, uh, get the same degree of gene expression. So we're trying to have active uh, expression of putative genes that would protect us from getting progression of the disease or actually the origins of the disease. So um, the role of epigenetic mu mutations in myeloid malignancy is recently, as John showed you, mutations in ep epigenetic modifiers account for a new class of mutant disease alleles that contribute to the pathogenesis of these myeloid leuke leukemias in addition to the genes like uh, JAK2V617F, exon 12 mutations of JAK2, and also MIPL. So these are the mutations and the epigenetic modifiers that have been reported. John went over that. Basically, we're interested in TET2, ACXL, uh, EZH2, and IDH2. All you have to realize is that each of these mutations is associated with an epigenetic modification that we feel is important in determining the outcome of a particular patient's myeloproliferative disorder. So these epigenetic fi findings might, I say might, this is all theory, might account for the heterogeneity of the clinical course of patients with myeloproliferative disorders. Here's a list of a small list but growing list of chromatin modifying agents that have been evaluated in um, myeloproliferative disorders. Again, these are drugs that affect the gene expression pattern or epige epigenome. And you can see that there's a variety, sorry, there's a variety, there's a variety of histone deacetylase inhibitors. These are published studies. And then there's some drugs that affect DNA methyltransferase inhibitor. In the time that I have left, I'd like to just review the studies that we currently have at our own institution. So we were interested in this uh, constitutive mobilization, why uh, stem cells mobilized into the peripheral blood in patients with myelofibrosis. And what we showed was that two of these drugs, these epigenetic-based type drugs, 5-azacitidine or decitabine, associated with the histone deacetylase inhibitor, which is called SAHA, when we, that, that led to increased expression of a receptor that keeps cells within the marrow because that receptor was downregulated in patients with myelofibrosis. And when we took cells from patients with myelofibrosis and incubated them with these drugs, you can see this is the percentage of JAK2V617F negative colonies that we crone laboratory. You can see that the number of colonies that lack the JAK2 mutation was markedly increased to a statistically significant degree. Then we took, just focus on the last column, then we did what John was talking about as a, a uh, <clears throat> stem cell assay for human stem cells from patients with myeloproliferative disorders where we treated these cells from a patient who had jak 2 b 617 f positive myelofibrosis with these two combination of uh, epigenetic-based drugs. And here you can see the percent of jak 2 b 617 f positive cells in the human cells in this mouse after six months. Here you can see that there's a large amount of jak 2 b 617 f positive cells. While when we treated them, with 5 as a D TSA, which are the chromatin modifying agents or the drugs that affect epigenetics, there was a marked diminution, suggesting that we had eliminated some of the stem cells that are responsible for this particular disease. So I have a wonderful colleague, John Mascarenas, who pursued a phase one trial of a histone deacetylase inhibitor that's called LBH589. And that's a drug that's made by Novartis. And we did this as an investigator-initiated trial. And what we did is it was a phase one trial. And phase one trials are difficult trials for patients to participate in because they're really dose-finding studies. We're looking for, for a signal, but we're really looking for, 
pool for what is the toxicities of the, of the drug. So during this initial evaluable period, that's the toxicity period. And then if you get through the toxicity period, you essentially can go on this drug long term. And we have now patients who have been on this drug three and four years. So this is um, not a non-toxic drug. It has some GI toxicity. Its major toxicity is thrombocytopenia. That is, it lowers people's platelet counts. So that is an issue. But it also has a lot of biological activity. These are the initial patients in the um, phase one study. You can see these are spleen sizes, percent change from baseline. And you can see that many of the patients had dramatic reductions of their spleens. What we learned is that many of the patients dropped off early in the study because of thrombocytopenia, because we were doing a phase one trial. But there was a cohort of patients where we were able to get them through the 28-day period and then lower their dose and maintain them now on therapy. These cycles that I'm showing you are an underestimate. Many of these patients have been on three or four years. And we showed using standard criteria, these IWG response criteria, which are imperfect but are standard in our field, that many of these patients had clinical improvement. That is, they had improvement in their blood counts, Im improvement in their systemic symptoms, and resolution of splenomegaly. So this is an interesting patient. This is a patient who uh, continues on this drug. This is a patient who had massive splenomegaly. As you can see, that the patient um, was anemic, that purple line. There is, um, is the anemia, and um, patient uh, initially had um, a highish platelet count, went down with the treatment. Here we got through the phase one period. We lowered the dose. We had to dose reduce the drug. And then the patient was able to tolerate this therapy for long periods of time. And as you can see, with prolonged therapy, this uh, drug led to basically normalization of blood counts and also resolution of splenomegaly. So this class of drugs is a little bit different. Like with the JAK2 inhibitors, you're really thrilled if you get a very, very rapid response. You get immediate recovery, uh, immediate response. With these kinds of drugs, you have to be on them for a long period of time. The duration of treatment is what is the most important aspect to this. Here's a peripheral blood smear on this patient. Starting, you can see there are teardrop red blood cells, nucleated red blood cells. Post-treatment, 15 cycles later, the patient no longer had the leukoerythroblastic blood picture that's characteristic of this disorder. Here's the initial marrow, <clears throat> which is myelodepleted. And you can see 15 months later, there was reconstitution of hematopoiesis. Now, we, I'm not going to tell you that we're seeing this in every patient, but we are seeing this in a significant subset of patients with this disorder, suggesting that these diseases perhaps act at the level of the stem cell or at the microenvironment. And that's why we're excited about this group of compounds. And here you can see a reticulant stain where there was intense fibrosis. And there was significant resolution, perhaps not total re resolution, of the reticulant fibrosis. So obviously, this is a class of agents that we're very, very interested in. Now, are these agents going to be working alone? My hypothesis is that they're not. Most cancers we don't treat with single agents. We treat with multiple agents. So what the future really brings is agents will be used in combination. Agents should be directed against cancer progenitor cells or stem cells rather than, or the tumor microenvironment rather than just lowering counts. Drug combinations in the best of all worlds should be rationally designed. And the degree of toxicity should be acceptable because of the chronicity of these diseases. And in fact, allogeneic stem cell transplantation can be a component of this combined modality um, therapy. So now we're, all of you or many of you are on single agents. I think as time progresses and the field progresses, hopefully we'll make progress that multiple agents could be used. So this is a very simple slide. 
It's uh, basically bioluminescent, so the reddish colors basically show tumor that are uh, tumor cells that have the human JAK2. And um, what you can easily see here is, this is stuff that was actually done by scientists at Novartis, is you can see that the um, animals uh, that just got the vehicle didn't get the panabinostat. <clears throat> they have a lot of tumor. By contrast, those animals that the, got the combination of ruxolinamid and panabinostat, at least in this preclinical model, and I'm saying not telling you that this is a direct extrapolation to man because that would be totally inappropriate, but this at least shows that that combination is quite effective in this animal model. And that has prompted uh, the institution of this combined modality study, which is panabinostat and ruxolitimid that we're, we're running as a phase one slash two trial at Sinai, and John heads that trial. And that is just an outline of the trial, and we're presently enrolling patients in the, in the phase one, the, the second cohort of the phase, phase one trial. I think it's, it's showing promise. Now, ruxolinimid therapy is terrific therapy. For patients who have myelofibrosis, it improves their symptoms, improves their quality of life, they gain weight. I've seen all too many patients go from the horizontal to the vertical, become active members of their society who've gotten this drug. But this drug has limitations, and it was highlighted to me by the observation of this patient, who's one of my own patients, who was taking ruxolitimid for intermediate to myelofibrosis, and about two years into the treatment, developed this rash. And this rash, um, I, to be totally honest, I thought it was a drug rash and kind of blew it off, which I'm sort of embarrassed about. But she went to the extreme to get this biopsied from a dermatologist, and it turned out to be leukemia cutis. It was an extramedullary transformation of her acute leukemia with ruxolitimin. And we've seen this now in several patients who are on ruxolitimin therapy. So ruxolitimin is a fantastic treatment for improving your symptoms. But the data that it prevents progression to leukemia is still yet to be determined even though there is some data that it has a modest effect on survival. So this is an area of great interest to us because as I told you, leukemia in patients who have myeloproliferative disorders is a nasty disease. This is the thing that we really want to avoid at great, at great expense. This is a paper um, published by my close colleague, Ruben Mesa, who unfortunately can't be here today. This shows the survival, median survival, of patients getting supportive care, non-induction chemotherapy, or induction chemotherapy. That is like the regular kind of chemotherapy that you give for patients with primary AML. And you can see that the survival of patients who have leukemia is, is essentially, in this setting, is really in, measured in months. So we've started to explore these uh, uh, DNA methyltransferase inhibitors because we had really had a lot of difficulty giving high-dose chemotherapy. This is, again, a paper that was published by John a number of years ago in leukemia research that some people didn't believe, but it's actually been redone by other people. And here we have 11 patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms and blast crisis or blast phase, and we treated them with this DNA methyltransferase inhibitor, decitabine. This was not a selected group of patients, as you can see. The median age is 72. The median overall survival of those patients that got the cytobine was 10 months, which is far better than what Rubin reported in his prospective trial. And in those patients where we could bridge the patients with the cytobine to go to allogeneic stem cell transplantation, at the time of this analysis, the, um, the, uh, the survival was approximately 33 months. And our colleagues in France have reported in blood a year or so ago similar type results with another DNA methyltransferase inhibitor, azacitidine. So this is this same patient who had the rash. And we treated her prior to trying to get her to transplant um, with this combination of ruxolitamine and decitabine. And as you can see, her rash responded. 
I think the other most disturbing thing about this woman is that she had normal blood counts and she felt terrific when she had the, when she had the rash. And her marrow was cleared of, was, was not overwhelmed with blasts. But unfortunately, she didn't make it to transplant. So we've tried to, we tried, we've been working with uh, Rajit Rampal, who's a terrific young scientist at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and also Ross Levine, who all of you know, to try and do some urine models of some of the clinical work that we've done. And Ross and Rajit have developed an animal model with human JAK2V617F that models acute leukemia in this setting. And as you can see, I know you're not morphologists, but you can, these are the cells from these animals that, have, that lack P53, but are also JAK2V617F. And these are blast cells. These are the cells we don't want to see in your blood or in your bone marrow. <clears throat> and what we've shown, or they've shown, I should say, is uh, that when we use two JAK2 inhibitors, that there is some reduction in the number of, these, of colonies that are formed from these blast cells, both with ruxolitimid and also with the Cytopia uh, JAK2 inhibitor. I don't, can't recall which company now owns that drug, so I can't even tell you. But most impressive is that the combination of the cytobine and JAK2 inhibitor led to essentially an elimination of these hematopoietic colonies. And this is now translated into a study that we're just about, about to open, which is a combination therapy of ruxolitimin and cytobine in patients with myeloproliferative disorders in accelerated and blast phase disease that we're going to run on our NCI-based consortium. And the principal investigators are John and also Rajit Rampal. And we're hoping to get that study open in the next couple of months. So what are my conclusions? I think epigenetic therapy for myeloproliferative disorders remains experimental. This is research hypothesis testing. This is what we should do. But it shows promise even in these early days. This is the beginning. Even with the JAK2 inhibitors, I know you want this to be here now, but it's really the beginning of this field. And I think that you really have to understand that. We really need to do clinical trials. Phase two studies must be completed rapidly. Knowledge can only be gained by entry onto clinical trials. But phase two trials have a limit. They only give a signal. They do not provide definitive evidence that a drug or a combination of drugs is better than the standard of care. So if we're going to prove that this modality is effective, or any modality is effect effective in treating patients with myeloid proliferative disorders, we need to do phase three trials, which mean that we, they, these trials must be completed before any drug or combination of drugs become the standard of care of myeloproliferative disorders. And I really think that you guys deserve this evidence-based approach. So my caution about this is, is that I've shown you responses, but these are only signals and that we really have to go this rigorous route to move this field forward, both in this area of epigenetics, but in all of our therapeutic modalities that we deal with patients with myeloproliferative disorders. So thank you for the opportunity to speak and your attention. Thank you.